So, it's a rainy, gloomy day uh, this afternoon, and what better weather um, to study the worst, most baddest, awful, no good equation in the entire history of fluid mechanics, the Navier-Stokes equation. So let's take a look at what it is and how important it is uh, for us in practice. The Navier-Stokes equation is a momentum balance equation. Um, so what we do is we, we balance out inside a grid um, the linear momentum that applies to particles that are flowing through. And we have to begin with the eyes of a very well-known scientist, Isaac Newton, who tells us that uh, the force that's applying on particles is the mass times their acceleration. Okay, So we begin with what is now called the Cauchy equation, written by French scientist Cauchy. Um, and for this, we look at a box, a little box of fluid. Um, and we are applying uh, our knowledge about the three kinds of forces that apply. Shear, pressure, and gravity. So with those three forces, we add them up. And this must be, says Newton, equal to the mass of the fluid particle times its acceleration. So very simply, we write it out, and it looks like this. Um, we have, from the point of view of the particle, if you track it like it was an object, like perhaps a satellite or a car, and one solid object, uh, the mass of the particle times its change in velocity is the sum of three forces, weight, pressure, and shear. But um, what we want to do, of course, is to not use this point of view, but the point of view of the grid, the point of view of the stationary grid through which the fluid is flowing. And so for this, we rewrite this equation by dividing, dividing everything by the volume and using the point of view of the grid. And so for this, we have the total derivative. So the density times the total derivative is equal to 1 over the volume uh, multiplied by the force of weight plus the force due to pressure and the force due to shear. Right, so. Okay, so what we want to do now to get the Cauchy equation is to rewrite the net force due to pressure and the net force due to shear as a function of the fluid properties. So let's take a look. The pressure we dealt with in the previous chapters. A couple of chapters ago, we said that the net force due to pressure per unit volume was minus the gradient of pressure. We said pressure is not really important. It is a change in space of pressure, which matters. And so this already solves the first problem. Uh, we had one over the volume um, of the particle multiplied by the net force due to pressure. And this is just going to be minus grad P. So that's cool. That's done. What about shear? Shear, we also saw in the previous chapter. We said that shear had three components at any point in space. When we took into account all those three components on each of the six faces of the cube, we had a very tedious, uh, long way of, of adding those up. Uh, we said basically that for any direction, for example, the direction x, you had to take the change in all three directions of the three components of shear that point into the x direction. Um, and so this we had written as uh, the divergent of the shear tensor in the x direction. So we had come up in the end with this expression, the volume multiplied by a vector, and this vector is the divergent of the shear tensor. Uh, and so we wrote it like this, the divergent of tau ij, like this. Okay, so good memories from the previous chapters. Um, you take now the puzzle pieces, and we had mass times acceleration is the sum of forces, and you replace this term and that term by the puzzle pieces that we had developed in the previous chapters. Um, and you get um, this, you get mass times acceleration is again, gravity, pressure, and shear. And this is just called the Cauchy equation. Yes. So this is the overarching expression for the dynamics of every fluid in every possible situation. Uh, steady flow, unsteady flow, compressible flow, incompressible flow, Newtonian fluid, non-Newtonian fluid, just every fluid flow you can conceptualize obeys this equation. And this is cool. This is very cool. But it's not immediately useful. Because what we would like to 
get with this equation is the vector v, uh, which is a vector field. And you can see that on the other side of the equation, we have gravity, and the gravity is fine. We just know uh, what gravity is. But we have pressure, and pressure is a field. And then we have this shear tensor here, which is also a field. Um, and both of those here will change with time and depend on the flow, and we don't have an equation for them. So the question is, how can we eliminate uh, those two, and especially shear? How can we eliminate the divergence of the shear tensor from that equation? Well, for this, we have two heroes. Here on the left, we have Claude-Louis Navier from the École Polytechnique in Paris. And on the right, we have George Gabriel Stokes um, from Imperial College in London. And both of those people um, wrote up independently, one from the other, without knowing uh, that the other was working on it. Both of those wrote what is now called uh, the Navier-Stokes equation. So this is what we are up to. We are going to write the Navier-Stokes equation for the special case of having incompressible flow, because the mathematics are a little bit simpler for this. So let's go. We have Cauchy, the Cauchy equation, was, we said, Newton's second law, mass, is, mass times acceleration, is the sum of forces. Newton's second law applied on the field. Okay, and now we have the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. It is the Cauchy equation on which we add two restrictions. And one of those restrictions is that it's a Newtonian fluid, which means the viscosity of the fluid is just one property of the fluid. It doesn't change with how the fluid is strained. Um, and to this, we also add the constraint that the flow is incompressible. This needn't be the case uh, if the Navier-Stokes equation exists in a compressible form, but today we're only interested in the incompressible flow version. So, you have a Newtonian fluid, then in that case, um, good for you, because the shear, the, the norm of the shear tensor, is just the viscosity multiplied by the gradient of velocity. And that's kind of cool, because um, if you take the velocity in your direction, you find it's changed perpendicular to the plane in which you're looking for, uh, then you get the shear in that direction. Okay, um, And so if you now look at all the faces, uh, the six faces of the cube that we have, every time in an incompressible flow, we're able to express the value of that vector uh, using the, the local velocity gradient um, and the viscosity. And this is just it. And so if you add up all of those components, um, uh, to, to get the net effect, you want to have the divergent of the shear tensor, um, which is the sum of three components, one in x, one in y, and one in z. Uh, then every time you take the change in x of something, and that, that shear vector here is itself viscosity times the change in x of another thing. Perhaps let me switch the slide so you, we can see the equations better, like this. So the shear uh, vector pointing in the x direction, perpendicular to the x direction. Okay, This shear vector is a change in x of mu times the change in x of the velocity. Okay, And the same thing happens for the shear in the x direction, perpendicular to the y plane. Um, and this time it's a change in y of viscosity multiplied by the change in y of velocity. And the same thing happens for, happens for z. If you rewrite this, uh, you get something that looks like this. You get the viscosity, which you can group out of all those three derivatives, and every time you take the second derivative with respect to space of the velocity component. So the net effect of shear in the x direction is viscosity times the second derivative with respect to space of the x component of velocity itself. And this is pointing in the x direction. This is cool, but as usual, uh, in fluid mechanics, in engineering courses, uh, you write this on the board, and soon enough, somebody raises their hand and says, this is very tedious to copy and write down. Uh, there must be a better way to write this. And of course, there is. And for this, we bring in a new cool tool uh, that's going to help you impress your date when you're on your own date and you have nothing to say. You can bring it up and uh, have success. We call this the Laplacian, the Laplacian operator. And the Laplacian operator is the dot product of uh, 
two operators. Um, one of this is going to be a divergent and the other is going to be a gradient. So if you apply it to a scalar field, uh, then you take the divergent of the gradient of that operator. So change in space of the change in space of that operator. So if you apply it now to a vector field, you get a vector field. And this vector field is every time made out of the Laplacian of the component uh, of that vector field in, in the direction you're looking at. So it looks like this. And so now, coming back to the shear equation, we had the shear pointing in the x direction was a vector pointing in the x direction with a magnitude that was every time the second derivative of the velocity in that direction with respect to space. And this was tedious to write, and when I can just sum it up as being the Laplacian of the velocity field. Yeah, at the Laplacian of the x component of the velocity field, u, like so. Okay, so we have all the ingredients we need now. We just looked at the x direction, but we do the same thing in the y and the z directions. So let's, uh, let's take a look. Um, x direction, y direction, z direction, and here we have it now. The divergent of shear, so the vector field that's pointing um, everywhere in the direction in which shear is acting on the fluid particles. This divergent, we express it with three components, and every time the, co the, co the component is yes, the divergent of the component of shear in that direction. Um, and so every time we apply this as the Laplacian of the component of velocity in this direction, and look, this we can just sum up in one nice expression, which is the divergent of shear is viscosity multiplied by the Laplacian of velocity. This is it. We finished. We're done. Um, this leads us to the absolutely amazing, glorious, incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. Acceleration of the particle is due to three things. Gravity, pressure, and shear. And this we express as so. Mass times acceleration is the effect of gravity, the effect of pressure, and the effect of shear. And we replace this, this very inconvenient term that has that said the divergent of shear. Um, we replace this with the Laplacian of velocity. So that our unknown velocity field appears two times now in this equation. It's going to be appear one, appearing one time here and one time there. This describes all ordinary flow. Two conditions for this are again incompressible flow, so low Mach number, as long as you're lower than a thousand kilometers per hour, you're fine. Um, and the second condition is Newtonian fluid, which means mu has only one value. The viscosity has only one value for the fluid. Water, air, most fluids have um, that property. This is awesome. Uh, this is really cool. But it remains the question, huh? what, uh, what is the velocity field itself? So we apply our two laws, uh, one conservation of mass or balance of mass, continuity equation, divergent of velocity is equal to zero. And the second is the Navier-Stokes equation for incompressible flow, which is there. Uh, then the question is, uh, what is V? Okay, You have the two conditions and you want the solution. This is the problem, it's not the solution. So what is the solution? Uh, well, um, I'd like you to think about it a little bit um, because it's a worthwhile problem to spend your time on. Uh, if you find the solution, uh, well, you will win a, a little mug that we have in our lab. Isut LSS is my laboratory for fluid dynamics. And we have a little mag that says, I found the general solution to the Navier-Stokes equation. And this is really cool because people will ask you uh, uh, about the lab when you tell them you solved the Navier-Stokes equation and they will see your mug and you can show it to your friends and it's kind of cool. Uh, second condition, a uh, second co consequence is that uh, you will receive the Nobel Prize, the Fields Medal and the Millennium Prize, which is a $1 million prize uh, that's waiting for the person who could find uh, the general solution to the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, and the consequences for this is if you find the solution, the general solution to this equation, well, all of the computational fluid dynamics software companies will just instantly collapse. Okay? There's, no, there's no need to carry out computational fluid dynamics simulations if you can calculate by hand the answer already. Um, there's no more need for wind tunnels, for water channels, for all this extremely expensive technical equipment that we use to make measurements because what need is there to measure 
uh, flow if you can just compute the solution already. And of course, academics will be busy revisiting everything they know. Yeah? So matching their um, descriptions of flow with your solution and finding out whether uh, they were right or wrong. So this is uh, quite a major feat uh, to come up with a solution. Um, also, um, important consequences we have to buy a new a new mug, which would be uh, would be, uh, I guess, a, a positive a positive consequence. Uh, when I say we're looking for the solution, uh, I mean really mean the solution, not just a solution. Uh, almost any flow you describe is a solution of the Navier-Stokes equation. And by to, to make it clear what I mean uh, with the solution, um, imagine. Uh, you take a look at a different problem, and this problem is the problem of the cannonball. Um, and this, uh, the problem is what is the trajectory of the cannonball when you shoot it uh, one way or the other. Um, uh, it turns out, depending on the angle of the cannonball, of the cannon, uh, and the speed at which you start, the ball will have different trajectories. And so, um, if you have this law, which is the law, physical law that applies to the cannonball as it's flying around, uh, the answer to this, to this what is V, um, is uh, not, it depends. It looks like it's a lot of different trajectories, but as it turns out, the general solution, which means all of the solutions at once, they're all of the form of a vector V with uh, the horizontal velocity being constant and the vertical velocity being a function of time. Um, and based on this, you can redraw every one of those trajectories. Now we're looking for the same general family of solutions. Uh, for the Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah. So if you write now an equation that's just a little bit more complicated, but not that much if you look into it, um, if you have those two conditions, then what is V? Uh, the solution to that describes almost every flow that you uh, can encounter in real life. It um, describes the laminar flow um, passing over this weir, but also the complete turbulent flow um, that crashes uh, after the, the water has passed the weir. It describes the rain uh, falling on the roof uh, above my head. Um, it describes every splash of water inside um, a little wave of water splashing on the beach. Um, it describes the water flow around the hull of this catamaran, but also the flow of air on the sails and all the forces that result from those. It describes the flow of air uh, around the wings of uh, this uh, vulture as it comes into land um, uh, on the ground. Uh, it describes the aerodynamics of the air as it flows around this jet aircraft. It describes the cloud of dust that's pushed up uh, by the dying wash of the rotor of this helicopter. Um, and so all of those are solutions. All of those flows are solutions to the Navier-Stokes equation and what we're looking for what we have been looking for for the last 150 years um, is the general solution that describes them all at once. Yeah? So the incompressible Navier-Stokes equation uh, is quite complex. Perhaps you see better why it's so complex uh, once you, you, you get rid of this very convenient, compact, uh, very nice and elegant vector notation and you write it in three Cartesian coordinates. And if you do this, uh, then you see immediately that it's, it's quite a complicated mass of, of terms um, and perhaps an important feature in this is that you see that you cannot separate them very clearly um, you cannot for example take the first term in the x direction and uh, say isolate u from this because in there you have u yes but you also have v and w appearing in this term and if you switch of course to, to v to the v equation uh, then you see that you have also v uh, also u and w appearing there so it's a very coupled equation it makes it particularly hard to, to solve um, if Cartesian coordinates don't work for you, you can also use cylindrical coordinates or angular coordinates, um, which make the problem perhaps even more interesting. But in any case, uh, it's a difficult problem. It's a difficult equation. Uh, we do not, of course, have the general solution to this because it's not the Bernoulli equation. It's it's quite of a quite of a, a stumper. So what is it for then? Let's let's conclude on this slide. Uh, why do we? even study the Navier-Stokes equation if we don't have the general solution? Well, it helps us as engineers. It helps us uh, in several ways. Uh, the first way is that um, it helps us understand and quantify the influence of different forces on fluids. And so it enables 
us to quantify what is important and what is not important inside any given flow. And we'll work on this a lot more in the coming chapters. Um, the, something, the other thing is it, it helps us, it allows us to find analytical solutions uh, in very simple flows. In very, very simple cases, sometimes uh, we find um, an analytical solutions, but this is mostly academic. What the Navier-Stokes equation is really, really good for is computational fluid dynamics. Practically every software you use to compute fluid flow will have some form of a simplified or approximate model for um, the Navier-Stokes equation built in into this. So if you want to understand what the software is doing and why it's so difficult uh, to manipulate computational fluid dynamics software, then you need to work with the Navier-Stokes equation. So here you are, the momentum balance for incompressible flow.